welcome back. Second part of building the time zone steampunk clock for the uh, Erin the cab, the truck driver in the US. So l last video I made these bits and showed how I'd got that sorted out and showed how to make the adapter that you can use to fix copper and brass fittings onto the side of the clock, the spun clock enclosure. And uh, I had to stop because I could just keep going on. During the meanwhile, um, I've got another order for a ready-made NetNet Threadball Kitchen Timer Kit, which is always fun to put together. I'm getting very good at putting them together, which I'm quite glad about. Uh, also, I was going to glue, glue this on. This is the enclosure which has the motor in it that's going to drive the bellows. That, so I'm probably going to snap, I'm not going to do that actually with one hand which drives the bellows via a very small chain. Here are the bellows. Do you remember last time? This is off a cuckoo clock, or a replacement cuckoo sounder from a cuckoo clock. I've cut the bellows off, that's what they consist of, beautifully made. With a, and in fact, I'm probably going to take this paper off. I don't know why it has yellow and black splotches on it, but obviously it's some sort of a historical Swiss type clock look. And there's a metal, an embedded metal disc underneath to give it the weight to make it fall back down and produce enough pressure to, and here's the bit I've cut off, this is the sounder. So I've cut the bellows off the top and this was glued onto that. And I was thinking, oh, it's going to be that long. And inside actually you can see, possibly not with one eye, but it only goes to about halfway to get the pitch. Uh, if I blow into this, it didn't really do anything because it needs the sort of resonating tube area underneath. Now rather than doing it from wood, I'm going to do what I did with the Barometric Prognosticator 3. I'm going to cut some acrylic tube, I think it's 22mm diameter outside, m cut out an adapter made of acrylic again and glue the tube onto this and this time, because on the barometric 3 it's a bit like a swanny whistle where there's a plunger that goes up and down, moved by a scotch scotch yoke um, to adjust the pitch, but this just wants to be standard, one single pitch. So I'm going to also make an end cap for this 22mm acrylic tube. Let's go and do that now. And a one, and a two, and a one, two, three, four. Tell you what, look at that, I found the tube and it's even labelled. Cuckoo. There we are. So there's 22mm diameter tube and there's the black, which I can't remember what type of plastic it is, but it's quite waxing slippery so that if I make the stopper, the adjustable stopper from that, that slides in and out. Right, let's get a bit of this cut off. This is a bit of a catch-22 position. And here's the end bit, so I'm going to glue that on there. And then this will be sprayed up the same silver as I'm going to use for the cuckoo bit. That's going to sit on there, which is going to sit on the top, reinforced by that bit. I've got this unstuck. It's worth mentioning, I know I've mentioned it before. But that fitted inside here looks a bit of a mess, but that won't be seen and I'll sand it anyway. But if you want to glue something like this, rather than trying to drip glue on the top, which you will then see, if you get it positioned, put a fairly, fairly generous amount around the join and then get some brown packing tape, parcel tape, the plastic variety, stick it on that, rest it on that rather, it will then set perfectly and it won't stick. It sticks a little bit as you saw, but a little bit of gentle prising and it came away. It's a very, very useful tip because well, it's useful in all sorts of different applications where you've got something setting that's going to have glue underneath it and you don't want it to stick and it, you don't want it the other way up or anything. So, hey, thank you very much. I'll get on and get this thing done somehow or other. There we are. I've cut out the thing and stuck it in. So this is the end we're going to use to produce the note. Surprisingly small when you sit like that. 
While that's drying, I'm also I've peeled off that strange yellow and uh, black patterned paper off the top of the bellows, which reveals the little hole rebate which this metal weight goes in. I mean, you can't have pine like that on a steampunk machine. It's got to be beautiful, dark stained something or other. So, there's the dark stained something or other. Let's get this painted. This is really fiddly because the beautiful paper that they've used to create these bellows does love soaking up stains. You've got to paint ever so carefully with a fine brush around it. Also, the other thing worth pointing out is if you're going to join together two pieces of material of any sort, circular, or actually any shape, rather than trying to make them exactly the same size, which is very difficult then to get accurately lined up. If you have a little step, I mean this is a millimetre which is fine, could be half a millimetre perhaps, it just means it looks like you meant it to be there. So, top tip. Right, now for some reason, don't quite know why, but I feel like starting to work on the um, adjustment valve thing. So this is a 15 millimetre in the UK gate valve. You can see the gate inside that goes up and down as you twist the handle. It's a very coarse thread on the bottom of that, but we'll come to that in due course. The lovely thing about this is that you can then run the wires, once it's been adapted, you can run the wires through the pipes to connect them to whatever you want. Or alternatively, what's really handy, which I used with the scribulator, is you don't have to use this part at all. You can take that off and just have this valve screwed into some sort of wooden or panel of some sort and still have the controlling feature. Now the magic behind this, oh the magic dear friends, is one of these. For reference, the RS code is that. 6234186. It is an encoder. Handily I've written encoder. So once I've used this one up and I forget what the number is, I'll find this plastic bag and think, oh, there it is. Encoders are amazing things. Let's open it up and have a look. Oh. No, because I don't want to cut that off. So that's where I've written the thing that it was an encoder. Here we are. They're so useful. You get them in all different shapes and sizes, but basically they have three connections and two lots of contacts inside connected to one to that and one to that one. One lot of contacts makes and breaks slightly before the other one. I won't go into details because I don't know the details. Um, but basically it means that if you connect this up to something like an Arduino or Raspberry Pi or one of the other things, Teensy, um, you can then get it. If you need to have two inputs connected to these two, and that's just a common ground probably, I think common ground, it means as you turn this, not only can you can the Arduino or whatever tell you how many clicks it's turned, because I can feel clicks, I'm not sure how many there are around it, probably about 20 I think or something, I don't know, guessing. It'll tell you how many clicks you've done, and it'll tell you which direction you are turning in, which is incredibly useful. One thing to be aware of is, and there's some fantastic libraries too, for Arduino particularly, that allow you to that do all the maths for you and all the calculating and everything else. So you basically connect this up, say which pins you've connected to the encoder, and then you can look, read it and it'll tell you um, when there has been a change. But further to that, an important consideration with encoders is that it's a very good idea to have these two connected to um, inputs with interrupts. Now that means that, for example with the Arduino, it'll happily keep running through all the business and all the lists of codes and everything else that it's got to go through, lines of code, unless one of these changes. So if it goes from high to low or low to high or changes, and you can set that, um, it then makes a mental note in the Arduino and then next time the Arduino is free, after it's going shot through all of its code, it then thinks, right, I need to go and check that now. And that happens so quickly that it's then got time, even if you're turning this quite fast, not to miss it. If you don't use an interrupt, then another part of the code you've written can be running, and it misses all of this, because it, it only checks it every time it cycles right around through the whole lot. So that's what an interrupt input is. Um, so what we need to do now, on a purely mechanical basis, is get that into here. And the first thing 
is to get the gate part of this out. And like I said in the last video, these come, well all the ones I've ever bought, come coated in a very thin layer of, I think, silicon grease, which is horrible because you touch it and your fingers all go, ugh. So, I think it needs an isopropyl alcohol cleaning session, especially when I take it to pieces. There we are, there's its component parts. It all comes undone with a pair of pliers and a couple of um, adjustable wrenches or whatever. Here's the bit that does it, it's absolutely coated in this stuff. This is how it works, there's the spindle. As you twist it, because this can't turn, because it fits inside the slot in there, which is slightly wedge shaped so that you can adjust flow but it will also seal completely closed when it reaches the bottom. As you turn it, it basically has this effect. There's a very nice thick coarse thread here, reverse thread I think, that goes up inside there. So if this is held stationary and you turn that, the overall effect is that this gets raised and lowered. Well, we don't want that. Keep it for a rainy day. What we need to do now is to clean all this grease off and then work out a way of releasing this because I want to cut this down because I want to fix the encoder to it. This is very interesting. This is different from ones I've used before. You can see that that's captive. This seems to have some... I don't know whether it is a screwed in thing that might screw that in to hold it in place. I'm not sure. In the past I've had ones that have been stamped pressed flat so that they're sealed in and I've had to drill them out. I will put this in a vise and see if I can somehow loosen that. This is great. Sure enough it did come undone and it was a little screwed retainer. Very very nice. And the lovely thing about these encoders is that they're hollow. The shaft, zoom in a little bit, the shaft is hollow all the way up virtually inside which means if I drill up through the base in the lathe I've got an eel and then if I turn this down on the lathe I could fit that in the eel and that's perfect in fact that way round that means that this goes come on focus this goes within the body of the thing with the tap the valve um, on a couple little bits of plastic which I hope are the same size because this still seems to be a similar funny sort of diamondy shape sort of so I'm hoping the two pieces of acrylic that I cut that this sits on and supports the bottom will still work and then the top of this mechanically is going to be supported as it comes out through the the top of the tap assembly it's going to be supported there so you've got the lovely mechanical rigidity and support and you've got the electronicals bits inside right let's get on with that how fabulous just looking through my filing system and found the drawing for the chronological engine in fact that explains and shows the dimensions of all the bits i need there's the encoder there's the plastic base i need to cut out and this is what I need to do with the spindle. So it's going to go like that. I'll put the encoder in here. I've left that free. I'm just gripping the actual drive shaft, the control shaft, because obviously otherwise it's going to spin around very really fast. I've got a 4mm drill here, and I'm going to drill it. The, here are the bits that I cut out. They're cut out from two millimeter thick line, two millimeter thick acrylic. I've cut the pins off because it told me to do that on my instructions. I can poke the wires through and just solder the ends above. This is the funny little shape bit that goes in the equally funny shape bit on the top of the tap. So they're going to glue together. That's going to glue in as well. And then that's going to sit in. Like that. And the funny shape bit stops it twisting. And I'm going to turn this down to 4mm because I've drilled that out to 4. That then screws in the top. Bob's your uncle, fun is your aunt. That's now captive, it can't twist except where you want it to. So that's fabulous. It's amazing how small the encoder is. It leaves you all this other room for I don't know what. <laughs> Yeah. 
you get the idea. Once that's glued into there, I'll cut this down, I think with a hacksaw, because it's so thin now, it'll wobble all over the place. As I say, never do anything in the right order. Measure once, cut twice. Now I've assembled this one, and it's perfect. It's not forcing it together, there's a little bit of give, and this will obviously turn, rotate perfectly. And also the uh, flue should be dry now. So, let's have a look at that, there you go. So you've got the sounder on the top, and you've got the thing, I don't know why I bothered bunging up the bottom, it wasn't necessary because I had that. Let me blow into it and see what it does. That's lovely. Here's the silver paint that I use, which is fantastic, it is so shiny. But, as I've said in the past, the one thing to watch out for when you use that, rather than the brass, Funnily enough, it looks exactly the same without the lid on. Um, the brass dries within about 10 minutes and you can touch it, no problem at all. Overlay it, respray it, whatever, it's fine. But with this, the metallic um, silver, it takes days to dry if you put it on any sort of thickness. And then even a week afterwards, if you touch it with your fingers, you're definitely going to get a fingerprint impression. So I've learnt to use this really sparingly, and as always, you have to shake it for a minute. It is well worth it. Then, as always, I can't stress this enough, but the golden rule with spraying with aerosols is several light coats, or in this case, possibly one light coat. If you are so tempting, once you can see your creation being painted, just to think, oh, a bit more, I'll do it in one go, it's so exciting. But it will run, it will take days to dry. It is so much better to put a few light coats on. It's very difficult to do, easy to say, very difficult to do. Now I appreciate that, but it really does make such a difference. <laughs> And this, here's the bellows, and the bellows, there's the hill at the bottom of the bellows, I'm going to glue that back on there, I'll stain the bellows, and then the motor's going to lift this, the bellows up and down, and blow the horn when it's, it's the, as the alarm, basically, which is exciting. Um, what I've done, I've just gone over and cut down this shaft, so it would fit in the encoder, and then the encoder completely vanished. It has completely vanished off the face of the earth. Now logic tells me that it hasn't and it's somewhere in this room or in the house or in some of my clothes somewhere or in the garden or the kitchen. I have spent almost an hour crawling around on all fours trying to find it. I mean we've got the carpet of invisibility here um, and I have searched it rather like a not a geologist an archaeologist put a sort of grid down and searched every bit and it has vanished and I have no idea why. So what I've been doing, because now spring has sprung and as always the grass has grown rapidly and as always we have carefully looked after our lovely ten-year-old lawnmower by leaving it out in the rain all year since the autumn so it didn't work and I've had a very interesting and enlightening couple of days getting that to work. I'll mention it, why not? In fact, I'll show you, because I finally worked out how a lawnmower clutch works. Very interesting. Here we have it, the offending article. A reliable starting, and it has, I have to say, despite never having looked after it properly, it has regularly started with a few squeezes of the bulb down here. Um, it's started every year. It's usually kept under cover, as I say, not this last year. So, what happens is that rain runs down inside these Bowden cables, one of which uh, makes the wheels move and one of which makes the engine start. So the first thing I did was to drip and run tons of oil down there. If you ever need to do it, take the end of this off, get some rubber pipe or plastic tube, push it over the end, you can fill it up with a nice little reservoir of oil, say three in one oil, and you don't have to stand there dripping it in because it will just slowly run down and lubricate the whole of the cable. So that was that, that's the first thing I did. 
Then the air filter, always worth a look. I had, I hasten to add, tried to start it first to no avail. With the air filter, you unscrew it, and it's a piece of sponge inside, usually, at least with this type. You just wash it with detergent, get it all clean, white spirit or whatever, and then soak it in engine oil, put it back together, lovely and clean, because it really does get in such a state, I suppose, because all the dust and dusty bits of grass floating around as you cut them, it really does get clogged up, even though it's not actually running for that long. So that was the second thing. Third thing, sparkle plug. So the sparkle plug had... I undid it and it was all sooted up and all corroded and nasty so I thought I'd get a new one of them and cleaned up the inside of this high tension lead to make sure it was a good connection and it still wouldn't work despite a regular use of the priming bulb um, so I could hear the fuel going through nothing and I kept trying it and then I remembered I'd had a I tried to help a neighbour a few years ago he had about three um, petrol mowers and none of them would work and we tried everything and it turned out in the end that the fuel he'd got wasn't any good so I thought let's just check the fuel and these vent holes in the top had allowed rain in so you could see droplets of water sitting on top of the petrol so how to deal with that well luckily I've got this frightening looking device which is a glass um, syringe which is fantastic, ground glass, so there's no rubber seals, it's beautiful. I was using it for something else which I'll come to in a minute, so I had fitted these bits of pipe on, so I basically just poked it in the end and sucked out all the old petrol, it worked really nicely. Put a bit of tissue on the end of a um, screwdriver in to mop it all up, filled it with new, and it worked, such a joy. So, we now have a working lawnmower which cuts grass, but it's very, very tiring to use because the back wheels won't go round. Now, the interesting thing, and this is what piqued my interest about the clutches on these things, these lawnmowers, is that last year the wheels wouldn't stop going round, which made for interesting stripe cutting. They just kept going, regardless of this being squeezed or not squeezed, nothing. That's interesting, I thought. And then this year, not having them going round at all, regardless of putting the lever, I thought, right, it's time for investigation. So let's investigate, dear friends, and I'll explain, because this may be of help to others who haven't looked after their lawnmowers with the care and loving attention that they should really require. This turned out to be the best way of working on it, because you're not meant to lean it forward, at least with this model, because the, the cylinder gets flooded with oil and things. Leaning it back like that on a child's table and I found that a plastic garden chair was really good for holding it at that angle. Handy, and not that much petrol run out, which is good. So underneath, this is the arrangement. You've got the big spinny blade thing attached to the middle, which I'm just loosening. And then you've got, is it gonna, it's so bright out here, here we are. You've got this plastic cover, which comes down the back. That hides a drive belt, let me show you. Right, I've loosened these screws, and then you remove this, even after just mowing one back lawn. You can see the amount of grass that collects in here. It's amazing. This thing protects the drive belt. <coughs> there's the bit that drives the blade round, and there's a pulley. I'm hoping that you'll be able to see this. There's a pulley here, and a drive belt that goes through a hole in the back and I noticed with this something I noticed a couple of years ago that the plastic was all cracked and smashed up at the back the right old state so it was left hanging on at the front with one screw so I thought I'd make well I was in the mood waiting for the encoder to be rediscovered so I thought I'd make one out of aluminium and I, aluminium, aluminium. This plastic I thought would shatter and I think I'm right because something has spun up while I was cutting the lawn and you can see how it's dented that and I assume that's why this had originally cracked. So there's the bottom of the engine, there's the drive shaft, there's the pulley, there's the drive belt going through there. Okay, onto the clutch. Now from underneath at the back, there are the two back wheels. They're linked by a drive shaft which goes through this little this little box, funny little box thing, which is actually loose, it will rotate, it's not fixed anywhere other than onto the drive shaft. 
and there's a spring which I found the other year that had fallen off which I thankfully works out where it goes it pulls the front up so in effect it keeps the belt tight so that is against a spring keeping the belt tight right onto the clutch oh by the way just before I put this back together um, the reason why why oh, I'll take my hand out that's why it keeps going dark and um, the reason why it had stopped working altogether was because, and I'll use a screwdriver to point instead, the drive belt had slipped off this pulley. How on earth could that happen? Well, how it happens, and having done some research, it's apparently quite common, the amount of grass and crap that blows up in here slowly gets drawn round underneath the pulley and builds up an incredibly solid layer. Basically, it takes the V out of the bottom of this pulley gets bigger and bigger and bigger until there's nothing left, there's no V left and the pulley belt jumps off. Isn't that weird? But that's what had happened. So when I opened this up, the pulley belt was just sitting on here, not being driven. So that explains the not being driven part of the equation. But what about the driving all the time? Well, the nice thing about using a garden chair to prop it up is when you lower it back down, you've got something to sit on. Here's the back end, I flap this out of the way with a bit of wood. You get this interesting little flap thin cover here. If you look in there you can see the blade. Right, get out, get this open. You just repeatedly poke a screwdriver into it and there you have it. This is where the magical bit happens. Now, let's see, here we are here. This is the amazing clutch thing, and it is a proper clutch, a slip clutch. Hang on a minute, let me point at this without my light finger. There's the end of the drive belt, comes round a pulley. There is the spring that pulls up the whole of this, because this is sitting on the drive shaft that goes to the wheels, which is that. Um, inside the little box under here, there's a worm drive, which is attached to this directly, so it that slows it down a great deal. And then the gears that sit on here, one of the gears, there is a slip clutch with a little cam that pushes two pads together to link the gear to the drive shaft and that's operated by this. We have to have a word for it. There's a spring here which pulls it back and opens the clutch. And this spring here is actually, and this is I could never work out what the hell was going on with this. I was thinking, well, perhaps it just slips, the belt slips, and then this whole thing is pulled back. I really didn't know. This is what's connected, this spring, straight to the end of the Bowden cable that goes to the wheel on and off lever thing. When you pull that, this pulls forward and engages the clutch. That's how it works. It's brilliantly effective, but once rain's gone down inside the Bowden cable, this, as I found, wasn't releasing enough. That's why it was staying on. So it was staying on because this, this spring wasn't strong enough to release this and let it pull it right back. So the clutch was always on a bit. That's why it kept working. Then it stopped working completely because so much grass had gone up and blown round the inside of the pulley. So what I did was, in the end, I very bravely, having armed and eyed about this for ages, cut the cable. There's the can't see it with all the reflections. There's the lever that works the wheels, which now, oh, it's a lovely even movement. There's the join. One of these chocker block five amp cable connectors is perfect for rejoining Bowden cable steel wire. I know because, and I have tested one because a few years back, I had to repair this side and this one, which which is, allows the engine to run, has been on there and it's worked fine, per perfectly. Once I've taken that cut of cable, because this has got a little lumpy bit on that end and that spring on the other end, so I couldn't get the whole cable out. And I realised I'd have to, so I cut it, pulled it right out, then the Bowden cable undo this thing. The Bowden cable then stretches up. You can get to it, you can drip lots of oil down it again. You can get the inner cable right out, keep cleaning it, putting oil on it, putting it back in. Cut a long story short, after doing that sort of five times, it had, was no resistance. And that's why this now op well, closes the clutch and opens the clutch. I'll see if I can contort myself and show you. There we are. So that's pulling the lever. That closes the clutch. And then when you release the lever, that spring pulls it open. 
and it does pull it right open now so that the wheels stop going around. I will stop talking about clutches, although it's something that's fascinated me for ages quite how this worked and the fact that it's so satisfying making a piece of machinery that's broken and doesn't work or do anything actually work properly. It's very, very satisfying. So I'll put this little clutch cover thing back in. There you have it. Lovely. Back to steampunk clocks, almost. Welcome back, sort of, because a few days have gone past, it's been a lovely Easter, finally to be able to catch up with some family and friends. And during the meanwhile, I have ordered ten of these. I discovered the encoders, when I looked them up, they were a pound each, plus that. So I've ordered ten of them, and I've got free shipping or something else. So that's great from Radio Spares, RS. So that's good, because the other one still hasn't turned up. There comes a time in every project's life when you just can't remember how on earth you achieved stuff. I can't remember what goes on inside here. I've checked the plans lots of times and I'm working with the plans, trying to figure out, uh, fill in the gaps, so to speak, and I can't. So, time, and I'm very pleased to discover this, because like I say, I put this a long time ago, that I took the precautions of routing out a circle and screwing in this, because I remember vaguely, when I first started working on it, everything had to be mounted on the far side, so it was very, very fiddly trying to do wiring and all the rest of it, set it all up, test it, get it all done properly without having access. Let's unscrew the cover. Screws out. Oh, it's so exciting. What's inside? Well... I need to study this at my own leisure. There's uh, this one used a oh Arduino Micro because it didn't need too many connections and that could cope with it. And it's so much smaller. There's all my junctions with the variable and the fuse, which I can see now how I fit it on. Two stepper motors for the hour pointer and the minute. The stepper motor driver circuit and another step on my driver circuit. This one facing the other way so the light shines through that window in the front. There's the real-time clock with its battery so hopefully when I connect this up it will have not lost the time. And here's the switch. This is what I was trying to figure out. Oh and there's the LEDs and there's the micro switch. No not the micro switch. The reed switch. There's one there and the other one is just under there. And I've cut holes so I can mount them directly on this sheet of 3mm acrylic. Um, and they basically let the Arduino know where the, uh, the hands are so they can sort of synchronise them. But I've got plans with that as well. This is what I wanted to know. What on earth happens to the end of this switch? And what I'd cut out in the base plate. Anywho, that's very exciting. Oh, by the way, this time I'm going to be using an Arduino Mega. Simply because when I started calculating all the ins and outs that I'm going to need for this, um, the Arduino Micro, that one, I think has got about 14 or 18 or something, 20 maximum in and outs. And the Arduino the same, and this one's got 54 of memory serves off the top of my head. So that'll be plenty for all the other bits and pieces, because I remember, even with this one, trying to be really clever about how to save connectors and things. Um, yes. So I'm going to use the Mega, and I've also ordered one of these, uh, which is a very, very accurate real-time clock, because apparently the standard ones keep moving around, these ones aren't temperature compensated. They have the crystal, you know, quartz crystal to regulate time and everything else. But if it's very cold or very hot, they can still vary by a few seconds a day. Whereas this one apparently has all the workings inside this chip, along with a temperature sensor. And it uses that somehow very cleverly to compensate for any changes. And because this is going to end up in the the, the cab of a truck in the US, um, which is going to, I'm sure, get very hot and very cold, especially when it's not being driven, if it's parked somewhere. 
um, that's going to be very important and I haven't used one of these before so that'll be interesting great stuff right I'm going to study make notes take photos lovely I'll get back to you soon clock movements you say look at this this is just incredible one tray another tray and these ones are all exactly the correct pendulum movements for the chronograph kit and freestanding clock how fantastic these are the proper ones with a patent number in made by a really good quality company called something or other I can't even remember um, fantastic really good these are the ones that I've had to order for a variety of sources um, and I just got fed up with them slightly being different or not being able to get hold of any so frustrating so I thought I would buy them direct from the factory and then this is oh prized possession so soft and triggery these are the ones that have really caused me a lot of problems uh, these are the ones I use in the Nepnet throb welds again from this really good company and I can't remember the name but I'll put it on the screen absolutely fantastic these are trigger mechanisms so each hour um, it gives a trigger on these two wires that you can use to trigger a cuckoo or a bell or something or other or a Nepnet Throbwell kitchen timer kit I am so thrilled I think there's a hundred of each of these here that is brilliant no longer when I want to build another load of kits do I have to worry about where on earth I'm going to get them from thank you very much for watching as you can see things have moved on since I do apologize for waiting so long but lockdown well partially ended so we could see people friends and family a little bit in the garden so things got delayed a little bit I promise I will stop repairing lawnmowers and the next video which is already filmed I just need to edit is going to cover starting to properly build the electromechanicals of the clock so that's all very exciting watch this space thanks again any questions do please message me i'm always happy to help